about this panel topic. It's uh, brand new and Wizard World has a huge, huge, huge place in their heart for art and writing and video games. And so we're really, really excited about this panel and film. This is my film bag right here. Um, <laughs> you are joining us for where the synergy of novels, film, and video, video games collide. And uh, what I like to do is I like to do intros and then jump into the topic. But before we do that, I just want to iterate to all of you that we are 100%, our hearts are here for you guys. So if you hear something that we're saying that triggers a question or something that you're working on and you have a, a comment or a question about it, please feel free to join in and raise your hand and, and let us know. Because it's hard sometimes when you have something relevant and you have to wait till the end and you know might not be relevant anymore. So feel free to treat this like a family. I'm speaking for all of us, right? Jenny, Stuart, Rob, no. like a family, no? Okay, no, no family times here. If you have questions, raise your hand. You know, don't throw tomatoes. <laughs> so just, yeah, for sure, just we want you to, to make sure to get your questions answered, so keep that in mind. Uh, so we'll do intros. Um, I'll start and then we'll go down the line. I'm Janice Davis. I am a host and moderator for Wizard World and San Diego Comic Con and writing uh, uh, expos and things like that. I'm also a columnist for MMORPG.com. I'm an author of a video game thriller called The Holder's Dominion. I also do voiceover work for uh, video game uh, YouTube videos and things like that. So that's me in a nutshell. Rob, what about you? Uh, I'm Rob Pryor. I'm in sanitation. <laughs> no. Um, no, I. <laughs> Yes. Uh, no, I, um, I'm an artist. Um, I've worked in comics and stuff my whole life. Um, I am a film director. I have a couple of TV shows that I created that are coming out. I'm selling a couple of others. And uh, yeah, that, that's, that's pretty much it. And check out his boots. He has amazing pa paintings of every, everything. It's incredible. Jenny? Hi, I'm Jenny Gibbons. Um, I operate uh, a little independent studio called Wizzy Studio. And um, I make visual novels, which uh, if you're familiar with them, they're um, very much like mostly novels, but they're also games where you can control the story. So this is a topic I'm very passionate about. I have a background um, in screenwriting that I, I, went, I went to school for um, at University of Southern California. Then I went on to write novels um, under the pseudonym Jane Woods. So, um, and then I went on to kind of combine everything I liked, uh, you know, both writing up and writing novels and films and also um, drawing and composing um, into these visual novels, which I just love making. Um, so that's what I'm doing now. Hey, that's awesome. Stuart. My name is Stuart Keating. I run Dioxin and Dove Games. We publish uh, tabletop games and video games. And I also own and operate a brewery down on Cherokee Street. So oh, yeah, nice. beer after the panel discussion. <laughs> I'm joining you. I like that. I like that. Anybody gets thirsty? So your guy. <laughs> uh, let's start things off, Jenny, with, with you describing as the creator of Woodsy Studio. Can you tell us a little bit how you draw from games and how you draw from the literary industry? Because you, like you said, you kind of combine both to create this new way of telling stories. Yeah, it's definitely a unique combination because um, visual novels, they, they are video games. So I'm sure plenty of people have arguments about that. Um, but um, the priority really is the storytelling. And what I think is uh, unique about visual novels is you're focusing on the storytelling, but it's still a video game, and you want the um, player slash reader to be fully immersed and feel like a part of the story. Um, so that comes in, into play with different choices that they make to control, um, to influence the story and create like branching storylines. So it's definitely a unique, um, Combination where you're—it's kind of like reading a book, but you, you have control over it, and the ending hopefully reflects something about you. So you start out with the premise, and you have a general idea of where it's going to go, but you leave it open-ended. Well, uh, not <laughs> open-ended, but you know, usually um, it, it's a little different for each one. Like in um, um, my last visual novel, Quantum Conscience, um, you have the ability to read the minds of other characters in the games. Um, and it was totally up to you when you wanted to do it, but whenever you chose to use that ability, which was kind of an evil thing, like you know, you're know, you invading other people's minds, then that would influence the story. Um, your main character that you're playing as, Blair, um, would behave differently. Like if you saw, uh, some, if you saw in someone's mind that they were telling a lie, then um, Blair would react to that after you read it in their mind. And so the story would branch according to that. Um, 
And at the end, I, I kind of had like four major ending variations, but within those there were still, you know, little branches for variations um, on different decisions that you had made. And, um, you know, my goal with that, and like with any time I incorporate those decisions into the story, is that you kind of learn something about yourself after you go through it. You're like, wow, I really did choose to invade everybody's mind. And, you know, this is kind of what uh, this, this ending uh, tells me that about uh, my decision to do that. Um, and in the one I, I'm about to release, Serenity's Crown, all your choices are um, have thematic emotions tied to them. So you collect points like for joy or for wrath um, or greed. And towards the end, you can yeah. see like what your choices tend to reflect. What you to, to do one up. A visual novel. A visual novel. Yeah, uh, six to eight months has been that's probably about time, the right? average. Yeah, that's, um, that's with you know being able to focus on it uh, in most of my free time. And I love that as a, if you're a reader and a gamer, you're getting entertainment in both ways. It's a yeah. visual novel. I just love that. Rob, you are an artist and a filmmaker and a director. <laughs> How do you draw from films and other novels or video games to create a brand new screenplay or incorporate it into your art? Um, well, usually, like if I'm if I'm sitting and coming up with an idea, uh, whether I'm writing it or I'm having another writer come in and write it, um, I'll sit down and just start thinking of multiple ideas and just whatever one whatever one hits me and if I'm being presented by another writer uh, I like to collaborate and, and figure out you know what it is that that strikes me and then what I do I have a film coming up in October called whisper and uh, it, a friend of mine came to me and said wouldn't it be cool to do uh, almost a silent horror movie uh, and I was like, yeah. So we just sat around and figured it out. And I started doing, I do all my own storyboards, all my own set designs, all my own creature designs. A lot of times I'll do the sculpting. You guys ever see Buffy the Vampire Slayer? Yeah. <laughs> on the last, no. Uh, on the last season I sculpted, designed and painted almost all the creatures. So, um, so I do almost everything, at least at first by myself. And then making a film is, You've got to be able to collaborate with everybody because if you don't, you're going to go insane. And when you're creating all of this rich lore and history for all of your characters and your backgrounds and your storyboards, not all of that can go on screen. I mean, you're going to have so much more. So, is there a way that you can take all of that lore and instead of it all going into a movie, it's going to probably fold into transmedia, right? Or oh, make absolutely. Novels and um, yeah, when you're doing when you're doing a film or anything. You need to know your characters backwards and forwards, and I'm a I'm a firm believer in in making it jump to different to different uh, mediums, like a graphic novel. So my movie will be a graphic novel. Um, I have a I have a TV show which it will be selling soon. That's going to be going into a young adult novel. Yes, she's right. And it, but. You know, you have to know, as a creator, you should know inside and out your characters, where they're gonna you know, go, what they're gonna do. Um, and then there's a whole separate subject about selling your idea, which we won't get into right now. But, but you really should, you should know your characters so you can translate them into different, you know, different aspects and different things. And, and all of these genres, video games and films and novels, they all have this fundamental connection, which is you want that strong narrative, you want characters that move you, you want Depth. You want your your villains to be just as memorable as your heroes, and like Rob and Jenny were saying, there's so much to there's so much pre-production that goes into it before you can expand into the transmedia. But whatever whatever genre you're interested in, whether it's art or filmmaking or writing, I think we all can agree that you can take the steps to do the job that you want now, and then you'll have that portfolio to show. Would you guys agree with that? Yeah, I mean you've got to you you've got to be able to do it right from the beginning and do it 
and, and build it and make it big. Stuart, you write tabletop games and you have to create not only the history and the lore of all the characters in the game itself, but the gameplay. Can you tell us a little bit how you synergize those two genres? I can. <laughs> so the interesting thing about tabletop games is you're not telling a story, you're telling a whole class of stories. That's so cool. So the first, the first tabletop game I published was called Three Days Until Retirement and it was about 80s cop films and all the players are police officers that are trying to solve one last case so they can get a promotion before they retire and increase their pension. Nice. And so you have to, you really have to boil down a bunch of different media, film, TV show, movies, music, uh, video games, books, comic books, everything into its core categories and really strip it down to the archetypes and then set up gameplay mechanics so that people can play true to the characters they're imagining. Because you're not setting up the characters for them, they're creating their own characters and you're giving them the framework to basically write their own novel. And so it... It requires, it requires a lot of uh, goofing off, it requires a lot of kind of daydreaming to figure out how to do much, a bunch of this, or at least that's how I do it. It takes me a long time to put stuff together. Maybe this is all post hoc rationalization. Um, it, it really takes a lot of, of synthesizing other, other work and figuring out, okay, well, why was Star Wars successful? Why was Star Wars successful in the same way that some of the epic, you know, Conan style comic books were successful, and that's because someone has really taken the narrative elements out of the stories and figured out figured out how to make them universally applicable or at least make it much easier for people to immerse themselves in that world. And then, you know, everyone's like, oh, well, I would have done this as Luke Skywalker, I would have done this as Han Solo. It's the same thing in a tabletop game, except it's made exclusive by the rules. And then making sure that your gameplay mechanics tie into that is very important. So if you've got a game that's supposed to be really science heavy and crunchy, you want rules that are a little more complicated to make you feel like a scientist. If you're playing a game where you're supposed to be a you know a veteran police officer that's kind of slashed around on the beat forever and trying to retire, it plays a lot like poker. You literally use poker hands and other things and with playing cards to determine the mechanics. I, I was asked to write excerpts for different video game genres. One RPG, one uh, puzzle game, and then one FPS. And uh, the creator, the designer, he said, you know, how would you approach writing for all these three different genres for games that may not have a very narrative heavy availability but we still want to make an impression right we still want the narrative to be memorable and i i, I really you know i sat there and i was thinking about it and i said well you know each of those genres they all have their own theme you know fps's uh for anyone that's not a gamer it's first person shooter those those games are action-packed and they're fast and they're edgy right and your, your heart is pounding and so the narrative should be similar it should keep you on the edge of your seat and 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 the characters can be possessive or or whatever it is. Um, RPG can be fantasy and, and you can you know go extra an extra mile to really push the boundaries and puzzle games are casual so you know you want to, you want that that feeling in the narrative. So we talked about how we would approach that and stay hold true to the to the theme of the genre so that it, 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 it keeps that 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 uh, the essence of it but then in insert your own unique perspective. So I think that's interesting that we can pull from our from our history, from our experience as writers or creators with our point of view, but we still need to hold true to each of the genres. Rob, would you agree with that? Well, yeah, I mean, if you're gonna, yes and no. Yes and no. <laughs> um, if you're gonna, you know, cross genres, then just know. How, how no could you, you know, like it, without, you know, without destroying the essence of it, but if you want to insert maybe some humor, even if it's in a serious, type of genre. There will be no humor in my films. No humor. Um, <laughs> no, you, uh, you have to, you know, the, the, the thing I guess that really works best with that is if you're writing a screenplay, have people read it and, you know, people that you trust and give you information, you know, uh, if there's a part where there needs to be a little bit of levity just to break some of the tension, you know, you have to pay attention to your plot, your plot points, where it's breaking, you know, your different acts, and really go in there and, and dissect it, because really at the end of the day, especially in, in the film genre, you're spending a lot of money, a lot of somebody else's money. So you kind of want to shake hands with the American public and go, hey, what is it that you guys want? You know, you can always do something for yourself, but most of the time, that's that it's not going to get made. And I know a lot of people have basically done like little low budget films for themselves and it gets lost in the translation because it's being made for them one person when instead it really has to be made for multiple you know tens of thousands it needs to be made for the audience it needs to have you in it 
but it also it needs to be able to reach other people and that's I mean, basically my goal as a storyteller is to reach as many people with a good story as I can so you can add everything. I absolutely could feedback on that say editing the editing process and the collaborating process collaboration process is just golden because you light bulbs will go off in your head when your editor or your writing circle says one thing and you're like, oh yeah, the character does need this or this. And Jenny, I saw you nodding your head. Oh yeah, I was just gonna say about genres, because for better or worse, I'm one of those people who, when I'm you know working on a story, I really like to mix up the genres, but, um, but the problem is you have to be very careful about it because what it comes down to is what your audience expects. Mm -hmm. So if they you know are starting your game with the expectation that it's a certain genre, then when you stray from that, it can confuse them and disorient them. So I, what I think is really important is, you know, I, I don't think it's it's horrible to mix between the genres sometimes, but you need to kind of understand what your audience expects and make sure that you keep them oriented within those expectations. Start as a love story. I think it's a horror story, not a comedy. I respectfully disagree. I think that it's absolutely fantastic to subvert genre expectations. I think that whatever we consider truly, truly standout material, it's not just filling genre expectations. People that have taken the time to figure out what the genre, what people expect in that genre, and then twisting the characters, twisting the plot points, twisting the message in a way that you're confronted with something that does fill all those genre expectations, but in a way you completely don't expect. And that's why that's why it strikes you as being something tremendously cool and syncretic. Yeah, I think that's what I was trying to say is that you, yeah, you, because uh, I do agree. Well, like, like knowing what to, um, what you're working with and then. You just can't be haphazard. Right. Yeah. You know, if you're gonna, if you are gonna switch genres and you are gonna do that, then like I, like I said earlier, it's just know, know it, know it well enough that you can do it. And so it doesn't come off as this giant surprise, which I think what you were saying, you know, <laughs> it just, you know, can't just all of a sudden, you know, there's this love story and all of a sudden, you know, at the very end, the, the guy who just, you know, kills the girl for no reason. <laughs> Unless, of course, that, you know, has a good little plot twist that you were planning and setting up early on. Once you're intentionally, yeah, you know, trying to have that shock effect. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Interesting. Uh, yes, sir, you have a question. Yeah, I did have a question, like, a while back, like, the whole meshing of, like, oh, yeah. yeah, you're thinking, like, three extras of video games, like, so, um, how would you try and write for a genre of fighting games? Because, I mean, I heard there's fighting games with some story, and some of them are pretty good, some of them are pretty bad. Like, what would you do, like, to take on that challenge? Yeah, are you trying like a fighting game, like specifically like Street Fighter, or talking about like a uh, something more like say Guilty Gear or Blaze? But those have more of a story than say Street Fighter. But... You know, it's 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 it really comes down to the characters that are your highlighted characters because it's such a small window of writing that you want the entire backstory and lore all written out for each of those characters, and then you're going to pick the most bone chilling dialogue that really describes that character or this situation, that scene, in a second. I mean, you, you sometimes only have five to ten seconds for, for the audience to know what's at stake, what is that character's goal, what what is what will what line will he cross to get to A to B, and that dialogue is crucial. So I would I would approach it by doing all of my pre-production work first, laying out all of the world, the character, the storyline, and then really meditating on what in this five to ten seconds is at stake. What is gonna burn up in flames? What you know? Who's gonna kill who? Who's the enemy? Is what? Is he possessive? Is he aggressive? Is she you know conniving? Is you know what is it? And then we have to tweak that dialogue to say that in those few seconds. Jenny, as a writer, do you not want to add any more to the fighting? Yeah, well, I was gonna say uh, you know I haven't written for fighting games, so I, so, uh, I can't speak from experience on that, but. Um, I think, I think, like you said, what it comes down to it, it's just being true to the characters and also the fast-paced nature of Definitely. Uh, like, Rob, your horror game. film is very fast-paced, and you have very small room for dialogue. Actually, that's a perfect example, because the whole film is almost silent with just a few little things of dialogue here and there. And that, to me, that's such a cool idea, because a two-hour feature film with only a couple little lines of dialogue that has to describe who those characters are, what's at stake, who is this who enemy, who's going to betray who would you yeah and well to the fighting game and yeah. I haven't written a fighting game but I can generally just tell you st in story because everything that we do even up here all comes from a story base whether you're boiling it down to its, its essential core or whether you know you're expanding on it um, if you so I guess what I'm saying is if you want to put a story to it then put a story to it because you already at that point have all the connecting points 
it's about how well you can create and make those connecting points their own their own stories to fit in. Yeah, it's like so none of that's impossible. I mean it's all it's all relevant. I recommend watching Bloodsport starring Jean Claude Van Damme. I'm not watching Bloodsport. It's fantastic. <laughs> or any of the Rocky movies. Uh, yes, sir, the green and white hat. Especially your older fighting games, Street Fighter things like that. Originally, those out of out of non-fighter games. Like the, you, know, you hear about Street Fighter, the original Street Fighter was was a side story but with your character. There wasn't a whole lot of storyline to it. Yeah, it was most, just like where you're just traveling the world. Right. The most, most of the story plots that come out of those, like Street Fighter and some of the other old ones, like Fatal Fury, which isn't as prevalent anymore, and things like that, actually come through most of their short films come through in their movies. Um, there's been a lot of animated motion pictures and different things like that that really get on the backstory of the game, just don't touch, and then when you get a newer thing that acts as like yeah. Tony Gear and a lot of them, yeah. they do it middle of the game. And just yeah, a little louder of the name of the movie you said? Like for for the Street Fighter genre, yeah, Street Fighter has three or four animated movies and an animated TV series. And they have a few live action movies. And they have the yeah. live action So they're talking about Street, fan, Street Fighter live action. Yeah. 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 And I'm talking about that. Also, we're talking about video. That's right, that's right. And that's 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 right. Right. And I don't know, that's story right. mode, like follows the characters. like Exactly, exactly. Group. Following the characters, I love that. Yes. And, and you know, Stuart, if you want to kick us off on that same track, how, what do you foresee happening in the future of transmedia where, you know, video games are pulling from films where we're getting cutscenes and these amazing cinematics right in the middle of hearts of video games and films are pulling from games and, you know, we have Avengers and we have, you know, we have all these comics going into films and where, where do you see that going? Well, I, I see it making a lot of money for a very select few but, uh, people. Uh, <laughs> oh, well, they're not, they're not going to make money. That's curious, um, you know, how, so, like writers, filmmakers, what do they need to keep in mind for this future of collision, for you know, all of these genres pulling from each other? Does everyone need to be able to write films, novels, video games, or do you still have your niche and you can just contribute? You, you see what I mean? I think, I think that the really great thing is that you have all these blending of stories and you have these blending of techniques and mechanics and everything else. I think the most important thing to remember is that you need to trust your audience. Uh, what, I, what, what frustrates me in a lot of video games that have incorporated heavy cinematic elements is they repeatedly take control away from the player and they, they, they have this, this ability to produce really gorgeous visuals, but the storytelling behind a lot of it ends up being really ham-handed and overdone and they just beat you over the head with the plot points and they don't, they don't trust you. I mean, has anyone seen the new Mad Max? Yeah. Don't worry, I'm not going to say bad things about it. Yeah, yeah, no spoilers. Mad Max absolutely trusts its audience. They don't give you they don't give you any exposition. They don't give you any background. So the background stuff is all learned from visual cues, and it works tremendously well. And I think that people love it because it's a it's a breath of fresh air from all of these kind of Lord of the Rings style. And here is the plot. And here is a callback to the plot. Remember, this is the plot. We've been doing this for nine hours, and now there are three more films which call back to the original plot. Like you don't need that shit. People are smart. People have seen these movies. People have played these games. Now that everything is meshing together. Some people have played the played the movie and seen the video game. So it's, that's a really good point because even in filmmaking. Like we were saying, it you have to you have to not only do you have to make stuff for your audience, and when I said that earlier, that's part of what I was saying is you have to be able to trust your audience and to make a smart enough movie. For me, it would be movie or TV series. Um, but even when I was doing comics all the time, you have to just be able to go, hey, how can I get a point across without beating somebody over the head? Because especially in video games, that shit happens all of the time. So, um, yeah, with, with I think it's a really exciting time that all of these different uh, mediums um, have been blending and crossing over so much. I feel like we're still in kind of an awkward stage where uh, people are, you know, of course this has been happening for a while, but, you know, taking a really popular book um, and turning it straight into a movie. And I think what's the problem is sometimes that happens too fast and people really need to understand the differences between the mediums and how the story might need to change a little bit as a result. Um, like for instance, you know, books uh, can be, well, you're gonna have a lot of information that can be conveyed uh, just through text in the book. It can be uh, slower paced, the, the plot, doesn't have to be in this three-act structure like a, a, a movie. You know, um, it's completely different. When you change over to a movie, 
Um, you really have to understand how the story might need to change. Like, you need to know the spirit of the story, but, um, and be willing to let it adapt. And I feel like a lot of times we're not seeing that happen because um, the people rush. just want to take what's really popular and, you know, cram it into this oh, other medium and, um, and hope that it works. Uh, and the same thing with video games, you know, <laughs> a really big challenge I have, you know, taking uh, stories um, into these visual novels, you know, after I draft this big story and then I'm like, okay, how, how is the player going to be able to change it? Mm -hmm. um, one, you know, your biggest challenge I think with that is actually your main character, you know, in a video game. You know, you have all these definitions for them when you're drafting your story, but you need to have the player be able to see through that character's eyes and feel like they're that character. And um, you have to find ways that your main character can kind of adapt right. in a video game to keep that synergy going. Um, so there are all sorts of changes you have to And like Stuart was saying, he was saying that sometimes with too many cutscenes or those you know, filmic uh, action packs, they, they pull you out and then you yeah. don't want to feel like you're playing video game. Uh, I have your question, sir, and then yours. Yes, sir. Um, you were talking earlier about genres and bending them and working with them. One of the things I have seen is uh, they go a little too far one direction for playing to their audience. You get the wonderful film like Snakes on a Plane. Um, and then you, can go to the, then you can go to the opposite end of that with, with the it's an expected genre and I'm gonna I'm gonna bend it a little bit and you get uh, Cabin in the Woods. It starts off as a fantastic horror film and then well it still sort of is but you're still surprised. Mm -hmm. uh, those can be great things. Um, your current discussion about movies and video games, I run into the problem of they run at two separate paces. A, a book comes out, they say, let's make a movie, great. Six months before the movie comes out, they say, make a video game. <laughs> Six months for a video game is exceedingly difficult. Everyone's worst horror story is easy. Crunch. Yeah, that's it's because, easy. Crunch. That's because yes. studios... It, they don't understand the no. fact that it takes the same amount of time for both. They don't think about that. They just... Dude, have dealing money. with studios, trust me, uh, you know, you have to, you really do have to deal with, with you know, pea-sized intellect oh, no, 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 most no, no, no. of the time. Uh, I completely it's, understand. It's, it's <laughs> atrocious, it really is. But but you deal with that because everybody everybody is paid to say no until they're paid to say yes. And when they're paid to say yes, then they have this crazy time period. And that's that's one of the And as soon as you know. say yes, you have to make money. And, and that's one of the things, that's why they wait before they say yes. We've got to make money on that yes. Right, and as creators, we have to fight for some time because creation takes time. It takes meditating on the on that subject, and you absolutely you have to fight the, the studios if you can. You got to tell them what you want. Uh, okay, I you sir, and then you sir, and then you. Yeah. So, Jenny, you brought up a really excellent point, and that's uh, kind of cross media. When you take a book and turn it into a movie, you lose a lot of story. And I know Rob, when I walked in, you were talking about how you really have to know your characters. So with limitations between different media and with different collaborators within those uh, media platforms, what do you think is most important in terms of um, keeping consistent? Like, do you think the characters need to be the most consistent, the story? So that everybody can hear, what he's asking is, with the limitations and collaboration, how do you keep the story consistent, or the characters well, I'm consistent? asking, like, what do you guys think is, is more important? Like, the characters, the, the theme of, of kind of your, your story, or... Or What's more important? What the are the elements that the you theme? really focus on and try and keep consistent? What do you focus on and keep consistent? Sorry, I just had to tell everybody. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can't really talk for, for tabletop, but I would imagine that it would be about the same and everything. I love character-driven things. I think if you will lack on your character, you will lack in your story. <clears throat> For shortening something or, or doing, doing what you said, look at Game of Thrones right now. If anybody watches Game of Thrones and has read the books, man, they're, they're taking a lot of story and putting it in, but they're relying heavily on what their characters will do, and it's even changing now from the books because they're going well what would this character do in this visual sense so character 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 that's what i think okay. definitely definitely and you sir had a question about the same thing that they were talking about right yeah i mean the elephant is now the premium hbo channel the show uh 
stores, Netflix, and I'm sure if we look at sort of looking at properties like surprise she ain't here to begin, or okay, Hamilton Vampire or or any or any premium channel or for a mini series or whatever you want to call it, the game of thrones, 10, 15 episodes, a decent budget. I mean I heard a couple years ago at concert was talking about uh, maybe about 10 years from now, we're going to do the Harry Potter book and the HBO IPO. So your question is about with the Netflix and the Hulu and the Amazon Prime and redoing books, do you do you think that yeah, it's, it's yeah, overdone? Well, the it's a two hour, two and a half hour movie, maybe a 200, 300 page book doesn't make sense by taking a two or 300 page book and making a uh, three or four episode so taking, I guess, a really heavy war book and turning it into a TV episode or a TV series. What do you guys think? Yeah, it, you know, it's kind of similar. I also want you to go back to, to the, the last time. question. Yeah, I think I can kind of wrap it together. Um, you know, I think it's it is possible, but you're always going to lose some elements in the process. And I think what you, what you always have to do is um, look at what's most important about that that story. Um, and, and for me, uh, like Rob, it's the characters, like looking at the characters, making sure that, you know, the plot, um, when you change mediums, it's gonna stay true to those characters. And also- um, And you and, and wouldn't you agree, you want characters, when we say characters, it's like, what does that really mean, right? But I, I think what, what the essence of what we all kind of keep coming down to is unpredictability, like not knowing you want you want your reader to be fascinated, right, with the character's choices and, and think about, wow, I didn't expect, you know, character A and B to do that or kill that person or fall in love. Like I think because when you just say the, the, the general characters, like for, for creators out there that want to know what you mean, you know, by that by that just general Yeah, I think the core elements of your characters are usually gonna be um, you know, to throw out some screenwriting terms, you know, like their their plot goal. Like generally within that story, what are they um, trying to achieve? You know, and what are the stakes for that? Like, how far are they willing to go in order to, to achieve that goal? And usually, there's that plot goal, and then there's a thematic goal. So, so why are they so emotionally driven to achieve this? There's something inside of them that's missing. You know, some sort of flaw. And try to stay away from those cliches where the bad guy is just out there for money, or he's just out there for power. You know, really dig deep. Like, what happened to him in his childhood, right? What What was his parents like, and his siblings, or at school, like his interactions? Because all of that will build up your dialogue. Would, would you agree? Yeah, and I think a lot of the surprises come out of that you can still be consistent with the character, but you're always going to have surprises when you have all these different characters with different goals, different um, thematic emotions, you know, that clash. And, and totally. what happens when those characters totally. Stuart or Ron? Uh, so my standard complaint about books, movies, video games, etc., is that it's either too short or too long. And I usually, and that's not like that's not like an either or. It gets, the book or the movie always sits in this awkward place where they could have trimmed 20 to 30 minutes off and made an excellent short film, shorter film, or added an extra half hour and made a really excellent epic film. But they kind of set, you know, right at the time. So I actually think, you know, a 10 or 12 or 15 series television show that's going to do with the content. They just like to rile up attention, and it's usually the majority. And then the other note I wanted to add off of what Rob said is remember that your vision is going to be different than anything out there. So even, like right now, if you want to do a film or a book or, or a video game sad. that is similar to something that you've seen or you're drawing from inspiration, but you're kind of worried that, well, it's already been done, quote unquote, it, it really hasn't because there's no one that's gonna have your specific voice on it. There's no one that's gonna really think about it in that way. And I remember Rob talking about this during a creativity panel where he said, stick to your gut, stick to your goal. Know that your heart is in the right place because you're wanting to create something beautiful and just go for it, no yeah. matter what. <laughs> I'm not quite as tough as, you know, I, I can get all hurt, especially like when I released my first book, you know, just that first bad review just, you know, killed me, made me forget about all of the good ones that came before it. But I think what you really have to remember is that if you're making something that really is new and unique um, and worth uh, a discussion, then um, it's then you are going to have people that dis that disagree, and that's a good thing. I mean, if yeah. everyone agreed, then you're probably not really saying anything. I totally agree. agree. Random House, one of the biggest publishers, told me. You know, the Holder's Dominion needs to have their female. I wrote this book, Holder's Dominion, and they wanted to change the female protagonist. 
to a male because they didn't feel that a female protagonist in a video game thriller was appropriate because they're a little behind. The literary industry doesn't realize that, you know, women are just as much gamers, you know, the 50-50, the, the, uh, we have just as many women gamers as men. So just like Jenny said, it crushed me to think, how can I, I was so excited to be talking to, you know, such a big publisher, but they wanted to change the core of my story. And uh, I'm gonna start crying. I, 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 could not let, I could not let that happen because I knew that in my gut, like Jenny said, it was a worthy discussion, right? I wanted to bring a female protagonist to this video game world. Uh, so I wanted to get you and then you, ma'am. So you had a question, sir? Yeah. I have just some good career evidence of the entire life and I'm gonna have to create some of these video games and books and novels and uh, TV series and films and to my career and have some given a good studies for the filmmaking classes and then we but then we have to do is to bring some of the good uh, You're taking classes play. in film and books and, and writing? That's what it's way of it, so and I'm gonna bring some of these famous novels and be doing this into life in the films. Oh, absolutely. Taking taking classes and collaboration is absolutely 100%. We all agree. Like writing circles, meetup groups. If, if you can get your vision and your story together and then present it to those close circles, you will get so much feedback. That is absolutely awesome. Uh, we, uh, right before you, I had uh, this woman right here. Oh, yes. Um, a while ago, Stuart um, said um, you have to trust your audience, and I was wondering um, what audience it is for, because um, with the media, there are so many different, uh, different oh, questions. One big I, I read so many reviews where they say, oh, I don't care about this relationship that it ended because it, it was not really there, but then I thought, okay, if you read the web blog, it was there, um, or right. um, this character popped out of nothing. Oh, if you watch the TV series, there was sure. So, so that everyone can hear the question. Okay. So, so how do we deal with like different <coughs> elements and transmedia and how they resonate? So she's talking about how the panelists were saying trust your audience and what does that mean if you're working on transmedia for your art and you are catering to different audiences. And Rob mentioned that it is there one is big audience. Anymore, mm -hmm. something you said earlier, anyone, there's, it, it's just an audience. So yeah, you're going to have different things. The best thing you can do if you're going to do transmedia is if you're going to do a game and a, a novel and a movie and a TV series, the beauty of it is each one of those things has a little bit of a different angle. So if one person just reads the book, they're going to get their world. But if that same person plays the game and plays the video game and plays, you know, watches the movie, they get the entire world. So it then becomes one audience. Awesome. If that makes any sense. Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I agree that it really is anymore. It's a, it's a set of an undifferentiated mass of audience, which is very efficient, I suppose. Yeah, um, I'm saying it's so much more intelligent. <laughs> uh, and so the, uh, the the big thing is like, unless you're working on really big stuff, unless you've already got a really big name, unless you've got you know eight zeros behind your project budget, you're going to kind of know who your audience is because it's going to be a necessary subset. You don't have the reach to get that whole audience, and your audience is going to be people probably at first that you know. It's going to be people that that like the same things you like because you like the same reasons. So to a certain extent, you can kind of, you know, if you're, if you're imagining your audience, you can say, look, this is, I'm doing this because I like this. I think this will resonate with other people. And you're like, okay, well, if, if you have even an 80s cop tabletop game is going to resonate with a lot of, or not a lot of people, some people, um, <laughs> why would that be the case? Is it car chases, the whole like sleazy Miami Vice thing? I and mean, then you can kind of, the same way that you would create characters for your book, you can create sort of a fictional audience that you can write towards, which is which is really weird, but it works well. No, that's really cool, I really like that. Um, we're almost out of time, so I will get your last question, but before we uh, get the last questions, I just want to go down and let you know how uh, you can follow our panelists and what they're currently working on, what they're excited about. Uh, so we'll start with Stuart and just let everyone know uh, how they can find you online, your website, and what you're currently working on, upcoming projects. So my website, I have a couple of different websites. Uh, the, the game website is dioxindump.com. It's named after the time speech disaster here in St. Louis. Uh, 
I've got uh, two published games out. I've got two neuroscience education games that are in the pipeline. I'm working on, I think, a collaboration sort of vanity art RPG with someone, and then I'm working on a suite Ooh. of Marxist video games. So think like the Civilization series, except you're competing with other office managers and you always lose. <laughs> oh my goodness, Jenny. Yeah, so. so my website is uh, woodsy-ca.com, and I'm working on a book called Woodsy Studio, which is a I've played a demo of Surfing's Crown, it's fantastic, so yes, make sure you give that one a drop. <laughs> Rob? <laughs> Wait, what? Care, I don't I'm gonna, I gotta play. Um, uh, RobPrior.com, and, and I'm working on, uh, I've got two TV shows, one for uh, Warner Horizon and Lifetime. And, um, <laughs> no Lifetime, come on, no Lifetime. And Sci-Fi Channel, um, and then I've got a movie I'm shooting uh, in October, and I do a lot of artwork. In fact, just rather than me babble on for a while, stop at my booth, 801, and you guys can kind of see what I do. His amazing artwork at 801. Stick figures. <laughs> and we have more video game panels on esports and uh, careers in video games and influence the industry uh, later today and tomorrow, so definitely check those out. And I'm Janice, uh, you can find me at JaniceDavis.com or on Instagram and Twitter and all those social media sites.